lifting with my firstborn, brilliant, passionate about the environment, writer, artist, teacher. She taught deaf students, environmental science. The impact she had on young adults. And she inspired them to do more to preserve the environment. When Melissa was 12 and Michael was 7, they both had MRIs, and that's where we discovered they had brain tumors. It's a condition called neurofibromatosis type 2 and F2, which is a rare illness. Over the years, we learned more that this illness impacts the brain, the spine, and the body. So my daughter's had multiple versions. The tumor was too aggressive. So none of the clinical trials worked. A year before she passed, we were on vacation in Mexico. And she said, Mom, I'm having trouble skiing. I'm having trouble walking. But for most of this person, I had any shunt that she lost more cognitive function. And she wasn't the same anymore. From a brilliant mind to not be able to talk, I did not want to remove hope. I prayed to her that the purpose of hospice care was to help her be comfortable. We knew pain. Home care was wonderful, especially for the interpreter support. The communication aspect was great. Determining hospice care is right for a patient is a, a collaborative, collective approach. There are several key factors involved, including um, patient's decline, uh, patient and family readiness, functional decline, medical prognosis. Sometimes the family understands that, the, that things need to change, and I can provide that soundboard for the whole conversation to take place. And the families can sometimes encourage the patient to say, Look, we want this for you. Don't be scared. Don't hold it. Don't, don't do things for us. We, we will help you. We have many tools in hospice, but the, the people are the, are the key to this. Obviously, our nurses that are going out making routine visits. We have an amazing support from chaplain services for families and patients that desire that. We have a, a group of volunteers that come that allow uh, that can allow a family a, a break to get out. We have a We Honor Veterans program through our bereavement coordinator that allows veterans to get additional acknowledgement. We work with patients at the end of life um, to determine whether or not they have specific goals and things that they want to achieve. We've done wedding ceremonies and also other special events that are important to them before passing. She passed nine days after her birthday. Her fate was already paralyzed, but after she passed, can you relax? And it looked like she was smiling. I thought I miss a lot. We were very close, very, very close. Then after she passed, I participated in the school, the treatment support group every week. Having the interpreter support was helpful. And I appreciate that home care provided that. Many people have not lost close family members and they don't understand the impact of grief. So we allow families the time that they need, helping people tell their stories, helping them get through difficult days, difficult holidays. When I was eight, I first came to Camp Heart Strings. Uh, my dad had passed away a few months before. He had been a big part of my life until then. And so I think trying to figure out how to deal with that loss was really hard for me. So children grieve differently than adults. And so we developed Camp Heartstrings Camp Dreams. And it's a specialty program for children who are second grade going into 11th grade. It's teaching good coping skills. It's teaching that grief is a variety of emotions. It's not just sad. If just because somebody is laughing doesn't mean they're not sad on the inside. I think losing my mom a few years after my dad was definitely really difficult because for me she had been a main source of support. Going to Camp Heartstrings I realized that there was people that had gone through similar experiences and that it was okay for me to talk about and I think it just really helped with me being able to process it more. There's very little funding for programs such as bereavement. It's a Medicare required program, but it doesn't come with any funding. Finances are scary after somebody dies, especially a parent or a spouse. 
And so to keep these programs free so that everybody can get them is important. Donations come into play for those folks who don't have Medicare insurance um, because a lot of those folks will have co-pays and deductibles. So we look for uh, donations to support the underinsured. It also can help um, our staff. Uh, it can help our staff to uh, refine their skills, um, receive ongoing education, so that they can continue to support the patients and the families that we serve. You have this, this short, ephemeral period of time where all the work that you've done, all the effort you put in is really worthwhile because it's the most impactful point in the person's life. The impact that that care has uh, for patients, but more so for families, lasts forever for people. Without this program, I don't think I would be able to be where I am today. I know going into Camp Heartstrings with a bunch of the littler kids there, being able to help them understand it's okay to feel upset about it and it's okay to miss these people in our lives and showing them that as you get older, it will, it'll be okay. It meant a lot for the family that we're not alone to the people from Hong Kong. Boy, thank you very much uh, for reaching out, for helping us through a difficult time.